Yesterday's concert is a Flaming Handshake Media production. I can't do it. Nope, I'm not ready. My cell phone sat among the documents on the desk in my dad's home office. It glared at me like a caged animal. My hand hovered above it and danced like I was about to pull a rabbit out of a hat. At some point, I'd have to pick the thing up. Jumping up from the desk chair, I ran to the other end of the room. My hands resting atop my head, I sucked in a large breath. Deep breath in, deep breath out. I paced the room and scrambled from one side to the other and back again. If this had been a cartoon, I would have dug a hole in my tracks. Glancing back to the desk, that tiny cellular device still stared back at me. It could smell my fear. There was blood in the water. You can't do this. You're a fraud and you know it. The tiny hands with the wall clock ticked loudly, reminding me that I was wasting time. The time to panic was over. Deep breath in, deep breath out. Settling back into the desk chair, the wooden frame creaked loudly in the silence. I tapped the screen and punched in the phone number. The ringer burned through the speaker. Of all the girls I've called to ask out, fearing rejection and humiliation, there was no competition that this was more fear-inducing. My hands flittered by my side and my left foot tapped the floor like a heavy metal bass drum. I placed my pen in various spots around the desk. It didn't feel right anywhere, so I decided to keep it in my hand like a security blanket. I brought my seat a little closer to the desk. Nope, nope, too close. I moved it back again. Ah, that's still not good. I was supposed to be a professional right now, yet I was seconds away from nervously pissing myself. I had one job to do, but now I realized that I had to add to my list. Don't piss yourself. A female voice on the other end answered. It was the name behind the email correspondence I've been having for the last two weeks. Hi Lance, it's great to talk with you. Albeit professional, her voice was nurturing and calming. It gave me a brief moment of reassurance before she brought me back to reality. I've got Tim on the other line. I'll patch you through. Fear spiked and slinked down my spine. The large red button reading in call screamed at me. It was begging me to take action. Ram your finger into it, man. Push it. Come on. Push it. This is your last chance to run. For the past six months, I've been working toward an opportunity like this. It was the only reason I got into the gig to begin with. I started covering stories about boring town legislation just so I could have conversations like this one. Despite living in a headspace of grandeur, I wasn't a natural. In fact, I was very green. All I wanted to do was talk to musicians and write stories like the ones I read in Rolling Stone. But now that I was here, my nerves were tearing me apart. How could I ever interview Paul McCartney if I couldn't even get through an interview with someone from a club band? But this wasn't just a little old club band. Maybe it was a conflict of interest, but this was one of my favorite bands. Hey, this is Tim Doe of the Wicks. How are you? Welcome concert goers, music fanatics, and garage rockers. My name is Lance Ingram, and in the season one, episode seven of Yesterday's Concert, our jam journal takes us to January 21st, 2010. Grab your earplugs as we go to Proud Larry's in Oxford, Mississippi for the wigs. Barely into the first song, the crowd had already turned on them. Where I was prophesizing a mere ten minutes earlier, these same converts were now hurling insults at the stage. Blood would be their only sacrifice, but they'd bargain for the music just to stop. The more the band played, the angrier the crowd became. Booze turned to middle fingers, which soon turned to empty beer cans and water bottles of piss. The projectiles whizzed past the trio, nearly missing skulls before exploding into amplifiers. The festival stage had been grouped according to similar acts. However, this was a glaring mismatch. The stage lineup included Simple Plan, Seether, and Disturbed. You remember those guys? They had that one song where the singer sounded like he was choking on a loogie. Anyway, the audience was a hard rocking bunch, and lo-fi garage rock apparently wasn't the taste for these music connoisseurs. While our neighbors refilled their piss grenades, Joel and I danced in the mud and sang our hearts out. For us, this group was a major reason we made the three-hour drive up. The band's debut album, Give Them All a Big Fat Lip, had been cycling through my car stereo for weeks. 
The lead singer, dark shades and long hair obscuring his face, staggered to the front of the stage. He swung his guitar violently to miss the mic stand and ripped a stadium rock power chord. A devilish grin grew on his face and he pointed to the crowd. To those of you out there dancing, we see you. We are the Wigs from Athens, Georgia. The Wigs aren't exactly a household name. In my unprofessional opinion, they were a band that never really took off like they should have. Fitting alongside the other catchy alt-rock garage bands that rose to fame in the early 2000s, the Wigs should be just as easily found in bargain bins today alongside the Hives and the Strokes. But their shooting star never caught like their peers in the early aughts. That's not to say they didn't enjoy some success, though. During a 12-year period, they released five studio albums, toured relentlessly, and even held opening slots for bands like Kings of Leon, The Hold Steady, and The Black Keys. They made appearances on late-night television like Leno, Letterman, Fallon, and Kimmel. Plus, they were featured at festival lineups like Outside Lands, Austin City Limits, and in 2008, the Bill Street Music Festival, which is where Joel and I saw them harassed by the crowd. I wish I had an answer for why the Wigs never hit it bigger. Maybe my music tastes suck and that angsty, disturbed, and see their crowd were onto something. Or maybe the band hit the wave too late. Or more simply put, maybe good fortunes never made it their way. Who knows? Regardless, they were and still remain one of my favorite bands. That's why it was such a big deal for me to interview the band's bassist. It was the actualization of two dreams, chat with and write about the band that I loved. My high school career was spent teetering on what I wanted to do with my life. There was no field exhilarating enough to convince me it was worthy of performing every day. It was hard enough to pick a favorite song most days of the week, but they want me to determine some monotonous task to do every day till I die. Not to mention my interests were pretty singular. I enjoyed listening to music and strumming on my guitar. But even in those ripe teenage days, I knew the reality of becoming a surviving musician was minimal. And what idiot would ever pay me to listen to music for a living? I guess that's what dreams are for. But that all changed one day when Miss Blankenship told me I had some potential as a writer and should consider journalism. The question my independent studies teacher now posed was, if you became a journalist, what would you want to write about? Well, that was the easiest part. There was only one thing, music. That's how I landed in Oxford at the University of Mississippi, more commonly known as Ole Miss. It was my ambition to leave the school and become a music journalist for Rolling Stone where I could talk to musicians all day and write stories about the music that I loved. After dragging my feet freshman year, I approached the Daily Mississippian, the school newspaper, and asked for a job. Desperate for writers, they gave me a gig writing local news for 10 bucks an assignment. It wasn't exactly interviewing Dave Grohl, but at least it was a foot in the door. Nearly 18 months after that day in Memphis, I paced my parents' home office while conducting a phone interview with the Wigs bassist Tim Doe. In a few weeks, the band was bringing their tour to Oxford, and as a budding writer for the paper, I begged my editor to let me write a preview article for the gig. It was a daily occurrence for her to shoot down wannabe music journalists authoring garbage about stupid indie bands, so I'm still not sure why she agreed to let me write it. But I had the assignment, the interview was set, and now it was my time to shine. My chest pounded and my mouth went dry. All those interviews with local bureaucracy were supposed to prep me for this moment. I had stepped into the big leagues and felt more green than my first news story, an article where I nabbed an interview with the CEO of one of Mississippi's largest hospitals. This wasn't someone I was begrudgingly interviewing for an assignment. This was somebody I wanted to talk to for a story I pitched. Tim was a nice guy, though. His tone was relaxed, his answers were open and honest. He was willing to talk. But it's different talking to someone you revered. Musicians were all rock stars when I was that age, and to some degree, they still are. But at that age, they were all larger than life, immortal gods walking the earth. It was clear I'd spent too much time daydreaming about Led Zeppelin and Aerosmith. The idea that a group could be a bunch of normal dudes who just like to play rock and roll was inconceivable to me. You're trying to tell me that all touring musicians aren't mythological beings roaming the earth as debaucherous animals? Nonsense. We spent the first few minutes talking generics. Have you guys played Oxford before? Yeah, we've played Oxford a few times. What's in the pipeline for the Wigs in 2010? We just recorded a new album. What's on the set list these days? We're playing stuff from all of our albums. The interview was fine. It was the same dribble he would answer at every stop and interview along the way. I asked questions, he gave answers. It was a chemistry-exempt first date between two parties that just wanted to go home. I was drowning. I wanted a conversation, but my inexperience was showing and it would take Lester Bangs to turn this interview into a decent article. 
Whatever growth I'd shown as a reporter was diminishing by the second. I debated giving up the interview and hanging up early. Then a moment of triumph shifted through the mundane. It was a pre-written question, but it turned the tides. Some of rock and roll's greatest bands are trios. Do you have any thoughts on what the strengths of a trio are? He paused. I could tell my question forced him to break the interview cycle. That's a good question. He was biting for more time to think of an answer. I tried to lead his mind. The Wigs are a no-frill garage rock band. Do you think that's something better served as a trio? It was the conversation starter I'd been looking for. We talked about the magic of bands like Cream, ZZ Top, and Nirvana. He told me about how trios are forced to be louder to cover more sound. There's less room for mistakes, but there's more freedom in being bombastic. My leg bounced in nervous excitement. The pool quotes were coming faster than my hand could scribble the notes. I was actually doing it. Look out, Rolling Stone. Tell HR to give me a call when the paperwork is ready. I'll be looking for the red carpet on Monday. What's the commonality that all trios... Hey guys, hate to interrupt, but we got about five minutes left before your next call, Tim. His publicist's interruption reminded me that I'd forgotten to pace myself. Not very Rolling Stone of me. We'd burned through our nearly 30 minutes and I still had a list of questions to complete the piece. But with time for only one more question, I decided to go off script. So I'm asking this next question as a fan. But do you remember playing the Bill Street Music Festival in 2008? Ah, uh, maybe? Sorry, I know it's a random question, but it was the first time I saw you guys. And I just wondered how you felt about the audience pelting you with beer cans and trying to boo you off stage. Oh yeah, I remember that show. That was so cool. We were loving that. Really? Loving it? But the crowd hated you. Yeah, but we were getting a reaction. I just remember looking at Julian, our drummer, and mouthing, This is awesome! Alright guys, Tim, I'm about to transfer you to your next interview. Lance, thank you for your time. Earlier in the interview, Tim asked me if I planned to attend the Oxford show. After attending close to 80 shows the year before, my parents were close to pulling the plug on the all-you-can-view concert buffet with a side of university. Given the ultimatum, reduce the shows, make better grades, or come home, I was attempting to be vigilant in the new academic year. I was forced to decide what shows were non-negotiable and which could be skipped. But when the bassist of one of your favorite bands asks if you're going to be at the gig, you definitely don't say no. All right, cool, man. I'll make sure your name is on the list. Say hello after the show. Despite reaching One Direction fangirl emotions on the inside, I calmly and politely told him, thank you. Regardless if it's Madison Square Garden or a restaurant with a two-foot-tall stage, telling the doorman that your name is on the list will forever be the coolest thing you can say as a music fan. It doesn't matter if it's your buddy's bar band or Aerosmith. For those few seconds, you're with the band. That's your almost famous moment. For the first time, you, the uncool rock journalist, is finally cool. Walking past the doorman, I was met by a wall of people. I snaked through the crowd trying to get a decent spot in the room. Much to my surprise, the show had sold well. Really well, actually. Packed full of indie kids in their flannel, skinny jeans, and cooler than you attitude, this was a huge departure from the angry mob at the Bill Street Music Festival. I couldn't help but wonder if my article that was published that morning had anything to do with the packed house. Careful now. Don't trip over that ego. Following a mediocre local opening act, the wigs stepped onto the cramped corner stage. Julian, the drummer, adjusted his cymbals. Parker, lead singer and guitarist, tested his microphone while Tim tuned his bass. Julian put his arms in the air, his sticks clacked above the dull roar of the inebriated and chatty college crowd. The noise nearly blew the windows out of the tiny restaurant turned music hall. The speakers rattled, the drums pounded with ferocity. The music ripped with youthful aspiration. Although the stage was barely large enough to hold their equipment, that didn't stop the musicians from jumping, thrashing, and swinging from corner to corner. Leaning over the crowd, Parker shredded his guitar, yelling off microphone as bleeding fingers dripped down the instrument's body. Julian locked into the groove, never stopped to smile. His stone face was menacing as he pounded the rhythm. Just as calm and cool as when he spoke on the phone, Tim took his bass for a walk and rumbled the windows all along the way. I'd love to run through the set list, talk about high points, low points, and the variety of songs they play, but unfortunately I remember very little of that. Their third album, In the Dark, was a few months away from release, so it's likely they played some promotional tracks from that album. 
Maybe Black Lotus, Automatic, and I Am For Real. But I could be making that up. Regardless of what was on the set list, I remember it was 80 minutes of loud, in-your-face rock and roll. After the show, as most of the crowd ran to the bar before last call for one more drink, the rest of the audience crowded the stage begging for a moment of the band's time. I hung back, checked my text, and tried not to talk myself out of saying hello. It had been several weeks since the interview. Would Tim even remember me? Surely he was just being nice about saying hello. I know they're some regular guys, but I worship their music. The only thing convincing me to follow through is my guilt that they got me in the show for free. It was the least I could do to say thanks. Hey, 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 um, uh, Tim, I I'm Lance. I'm the guy who interviewed you for the article about tonight's show. Tim grabbed my shoulder and burst into a large smile. Oh, no way. Hey, man. The article turned out great. Our manager said it to us this morning. In no scenario did I actually expect him to remember me. I assumed he'd feign remembrance, but in reality, he'd been up to too many rock star things to know who I was. He told me it was good to put a face to a name, and after some generic chatter, he introduced me to the other two-thirds of the band. As they finished breaking down their gear, I chatted with them about the show, Ole Miss and Oxford. To avoid overstaying my welcome, I began prepping a graceful exit. But that's when Tim dropped a bomb on me. Hey, if you're interested, after we finish loading up the trailer, we're thinking of hitting some other bars if you want to come hang out. Uh, um, um, say, say what? Say it again. The Wigs, a band that have worshipped their music for years, worn their band t-shirts till they were ragged and torn. That band wants to hang out with me, a nerdy music fan turned try-hard music journalist. I knew they weren't Aerosmith, but when the band wants to hang out, it's an even bigger level of swagger than having your name on the guest list. I knew this wouldn't be some 1984 Motley Crue girls 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 party, but how could I say no? The band said they were hoping to hear some more live music, maybe a local band, and wanted to try hitting another bar. That sounded great, I was all in. See some live music with one of my favorite bands? Don't pinch me if this is a dream. Except I did. I pinched myself. Rooted in traditional values, Oxford shut down all of its bars at 1 a.m. Already after 12.30, most places had stopped taking drink orders. By the time they finished loading their gear, those same places would be kicking people out rather than trying to usher them in. And I got to be the bearer of bad news. Parker exchanged glances with the other guys. Oh well, that sucks. Maybe we should just get a jump start on the road. The other guys agreed. I am such an idiot. I was the messenger sent from Buzzkill Island. Instead of finding an after party with some local flair or devising some miscreant rock star shenanigans, I sent them on their way. They slammed the trailer doors, we said our farewells, and they hopped in the van. Like a scene from a bad rom-com, I should have chased after them. Instead, I started walking back to my car in the biting cold January night. I passed a drunk couple arguing on a bench. His head hung and swayed from a stomach torn by too much Pap's blue ribbon and projectile vomit. Her mascara ran with tears she wouldn't remember tomorrow. They were my spirit animals. The cackling cough of an old vehicle sputtered behind me. I turned to see a van, the Wiggs van. It picked up speed under the Oxford streetlights. It rolled through a stop sign and disappeared into the dark. And just like that, I went from hanging out with one of my favorite bands back to my dirty apartment. Such is the life of a crappy rock and roll journalist wannabe. I'm Lance Ingram, and this is Yesterday's Concert. Thanks for tuning in to another episode. Sources and more info on today's show are available on our website, yesterdaysconcert.com. Connect with Yesterday's Concert. Sign up for our e-newsletter, or jump over to Facebook or Instagram and give us a shout, at Yesterday's Concert. And until next time, take care of your shoes.